The tradition of Buddha's practice in art making grew out of a pre existing religious landscape in India into which the Buddha was born, taught, traveled, preached, and died. This is a world populated by snake deities and personified tree spirits. They animate the landscape and devote themselves to the service and protection of the Buddha and his teachings. And in the earliest imagery we have of the Buddha's life, these figures play a very active role. Tree and Serpent, the early Buddhist art of India, presents the earliest surviving Buddhist art that we know of, which of course, by definition, comes from India, around 200 BCE, two centuries after the lifetime of the Buddha, extending to around 400 of the Common Era. So that is a window which represents in many ways the high point of lived Buddhism in India. In this exhibition, we're going back to where Buddhism originated to explore it in the context of the lived tradition as it was in the very early centuries of Buddhism as we can witness through its material remains. Don, welcome. I'm delighted to have you join us for this conversation about Tree and Serpent. I'm very thrilled that we, you can bring your perspective to this as well. So thanks for being with us today. Thanks so much for inviting me to participate in the tour, John. Shall we begin? As you enter the exhibition, you're confronted by a series of architectural elements from the earliest stupas recorded in India, concerned with representing the Buddha, but in a purely symbolic manner. Opening the exhibition with this work was an attempt to signal to the audience who come and see this show why we have this curious title, Tree and Serpent. This particular work embodies many of the ideas that belong and are explored in the exhibition, the celebration of the Buddha in symbolic form. It's one of the earliest, we're talking probably around 200 BCE at a site in Western India. We see the tree, we see the serpent, but we don't see the Buddha. Where's the Buddha? Well, he's missing in the form that we would imagine him, but there is a throne there. And so this is a famous example of what we call an iconic Buddhist art, a period of Buddhist art in which the Buddha is not present in the form that we imagine him to be. Scholars of Buddhism have scoured the canon to look for a statement that somehow prohibits the Buddha being represented in a figural form. We can't find anything. So why he was not represented and then represented, this is something we still ponder. Absolutely, and we'll see these themes repeated and repeated through the exhibition as we evolve from this early symbolic representation of the Buddha through until the fully realized human form. This exhibition, Tree and Serpent, could indeed have been called the art of the stupa because all of the works that we see at the show, with very few exceptions, were part of the original decorative program of stupas. A stupa essentially is a funerary mound, which then became rather more elaborated and formalized into this architectural form with a drum, a dome, a superstructure surmounted by multiple umbrellas, then surrounded by a railing, which defined the circumambulation path. And if you're wealthy enough, you built four very grand gates at the four cardinal points. The Buddha himself specified that when I die, the bodily remains retrieved from the cremation pyre should be buried in the manner of a king in a stupa, as was the custom already by that time for royal burials. But the function of the stupa is central to understanding of the veneration of the Buddha himself, which happens through the medium of the relics. It's important to know that the Buddha, when he passes into nirvana, he's gone. He's not in heaven, he's not coming back. All that is left is his teaching, which is sound, and these relics. And so the stupa becomes the presence of the Buddha on the Indian and later the Buddhist landscape. All stupas would be believed to contain a relic of the Buddha himself. And then those stupas would be elaborated upon, railings added. These would be the things that donors would provide as an act of devotion to the Buddha. And what we see here are some of the earliest and most beautiful representations of that architectural form. In envisaging this exhibition, I wanted to place the stupa at the very heart, literally and metaphorically. So we've constructed a pared down version of a stupa drum in which you are invited in. You can circumambulate the passageway, always walking with your right shoulder facing the relics within. You finally enter that space in which you'll see a selection of original relics and their containers, the reliquies. You'll also hear the sound of Buddhist monks chanting. And what you'll be hearing are the recitation of the word of the Buddha, sutras, which have been with us unchanged, transmitted orally from his lifetime. Oh. 
Well, here, Don, we've come to the case which displays inordinately powerful Buddhist imagery. These are the reliquies and the relics contained within, which have come from two of the most important ancient sites that were excavated in the 19th century and really embody the concept behind the whole display of this exhibition. And before us are these gorgeous gemstones, pearls, rock crystal, shell, a whole range of materials which all represent offerings by devotees which would earn their merit. The gemstones are from a site in North India, right on the border of Nepal. In fact, only some 10 or 12 miles south of Lumbini, which was confirmed as the birthplace of the Buddha. So these are very powerful objects, and for those deeply engaged with Buddhism, extremely holy objects. Well, John, I think it's brilliant that you've put the stupa an actual stupa at the center of the exhibition. As we know, the stupa is the most sacred physical element of what remains of the Buddha on the landscape of this earth. The stupa is the reliquary of the Buddha, what's left of him in our world. It's a place of great sacred power. And you've put that at the very centerpiece of this exhibition. I think it's wonderful that people have the chance to do the circumambulation. And of course, if they're serious, they should do it three times, uh, proceeding in a clockwise direction. This is a drum panel from a stupa, and at the top we see a stupa depicted, and it's embraced by Nagas. This is a key to us to identify that this is the famous Ramagrama stupa. So, after the Buddha passed into Nirvana, his relics were divided into eight, and eight stupas were erected. The Emperor Ashoka later decided to break open all of those stupas to make 84,000 stupas. One of these stupas, however, had gone beneath the waters and was under the control and protection of the Nagas. He wanted to take those relics as well, but then decided that the Nagas were worshiping them in ways that humans never could, and so they remained there. And so this is in many ways the most mythologized of, of all of the stupas because it's not within our sight. So here we have the Ramagrama stupa surrounded by Nagas up above, and then two devotees who are circumambulating, walking in a clockwise direction, not the Buddha, but a wheel. The wheel is the symbol of Buddhism, the symbol of the Buddhist teaching. We use so many words from Christianity when we talk about Buddhism, the Buddhist first sermon. But as you know, in Pali and Sanskrit, it's the turning of the wheel of the Dharma. The wheel is turning to lead us to enlightenment. So the wheel is the symbol of the Buddhist teaching. They speak of the relics, and the Dharma being interchangeable conceptually. The tradition of, of depositing relics in stupas and then the reopening and reconsecration of stupas, mm -hmm. this has a long tradition. And uh, when you find relics, uh, they're not necessarily going to be the date of the original structure. Right. It's been opened by later rulers or devotees and additional offerings made to earn Dharma, of course, to earn merit. This adds enormous complexity to the archaeology and our understanding and reading of the relics. So what Ashoka did in the mid-third century BCE, uh, that has been, in a sense, been replicated so many times. In the exhibition, we devote one room to Buddhist art in a global setting that goes back to early centuries BCE with the early Iranian kingdoms, contacts with the Greek world, and then the later Roman contacts. The two most potent objects, neither of which have been lent before and certainly not been brought together in a single place before, the first is a Roman bronze, a small image of Poseidon based on a very famous ancient Greek image. The original was monumental and then it became an ancient world tourist icon, if you like. This object was excavated from a small trading town on the west coast of India in 1944. And then we show that alongside this extraordinarily beautiful and unique image in ivory of a standing female figure, almost certainly a female nature spirit, which was excavated in 1938 in a merchant's house at Pompeii in southern Italy. These two objects really bear witness to the strength of the Indo-Roman trade system that was operating. On the back of commerce and diplomacy comes stylistic influences, ideas travel, art objects travel, and these in turn become the vehicles for the cultural mix that goes on. Kings are very important in Buddhism, and it's important to remember that the Buddha himself did not come from the caste of priests, the Brahmins. He came from the caste of kings, of princes, of warriors, the Chatriya caste. And he himself was destined to succeed his father, Shudodana, on the throne, but he renounced that in order to seek Buddhahood. So the Buddha has a strong connection to kings, and kings were important patrons for a number of reasons. 
Buddhist monks could not touch money. They could not till the soil. They lived entirely on alms. But as Buddhism became larger, they needed royal patronage to provide lands and people to farm those lands to support large monasteries. So this piece shows a king. We can tell by the fact that he has a parasol above him held by a beautiful female attendant. Another attendant has a chowry, a fly whisk. To his right is a royal young man who may be his son, a prince. And the king has his hands in the Anjali posture, the posture of reverence in traditional Indian religion. So, of course, a king is the sovereign. He is the person who is worshipped by his people. And in India, the head and the feet have high symbolic value. To touch someone with your feet is a great insult. The greatest way that you show reverence to someone is to touch your head to their feet. And so we have a king represented here in what is a stupa drum panel. But if we look up above, we see on the right a kneeling animal, which is a deer. And the deer is the symbol of the Buddha's first teaching. This means, however, that the head of the king is beneath the feet of the absent Buddha. And so this shows that not only are Nagas worshiping the Buddha, but also kings worship the Buddha. The Buddha is superior to kings. He's superior to the gods. He's known in Sanskrit as the Devati Deva, the god above the gods. This really is a most extraordinary work on loan from the British Museum, early phase Amaravati and one of the rare representations from this early period of, of a royal figure at worship, a subject which we see, in, particularly in South India, right through the medieval period. It's very true in India that all people of all rank submit themselves to the deity they worship. And so to see the king beneath the representation of the Buddha's presence is entirely in keeping with the Indian approach to worship. In the depictions of monasteries in ancient India, we find frequent depictions of great stupas, of course, and great gateways marking the entrances to the walkways. Remarkably few of these have been found, but in the last 20 years, the excavation of a hillside monastery called Panagiri in what's today the state of Telangana has revealed not only a large monastic complex, but traces of a great gateway. Now, these are works which were excavated in 2002 and the government of Telangana allowed us to borrow these and exhibit them for the first time, in fact, to a wider public. So it's very, very exciting. And of course, as you can see, they're full of narrative of scenes beginning with the birth of the Buddha in the lower panel and the first sermon appearing in the upper panel and a whole series of other narrative elements. In fact, I see on the right this very famous story. After the Buddha's enlightenment, he didn't eat anything for seven weeks. Two merchants came across him. He offered him some honey cakes. And the Buddha said, a Buddha does not receive food into his own hands. At this moment, the gods of the four directions came down from Mount Meru, each holding a bowl for the Buddha to receive the food. The bowls were in four different semi-precious stones. The Buddha rejected those. They came back with four more granite bowls. The Buddha stacked up the granite bowls, smashed them into one, and received that first meal from the two merchants. It's fascinating that the Buddha then did not teach those two merchants. He plucked out some hairs from his head and gave those to them. They then took those hairs back to their homeland in, in Myanmar, in Burma, where they became the relic for the Shwedagon stupa, the most famous stupa in all of Myanmar. So the fascinating point is after the Buddha's enlightenment, the first thing he gives is not the teaching, it's the relic. Absolutely, we come, always come back to the relic. The relic is always at the center. And I, I love the richness of the narratives that you're elaborating on as well. It's not just storytelling. It's a medium, a way to teach particular values and ethics, the teachings of the way that the Buddha illuminated for us. It's a wonderful medium, and deceptively simple, but very profound. By the third century, common era, the Buddha is fully revealed in human form and no longer represented symbolically or aniconically, but represented as a mortal monk, preaching, receiving his first meal, giving his first teachings at Sarnath and so on. This transition has never been explained. My theory is it was a way of making Buddhism more accessible, more immediate. So the shift essentially is away from narrative towards the veneration of the icon of the person of the Buddha, which in its portable form could be transmitted beyond India to spread the Dharma. So what we see here is probably the most familiar form of the Buddha for visitors to the exhibition. A standing Buddha from Telangana in the Southeast which is dated to the third century of the Common Era. 
One of the things that a scholar of Buddhism looks at when they look at the Buddha is to look for his 32 major marks, the marks of the Mahapurusha, the, the Superman. And we see several of those in this piece, just looking at the head, his long earlobes. Those earlobes are long because as a prince, he wore those heavy earrings. He took them off and yet his, his earlobes are stretched. So that's one. We see the odd circle between his eyes. This is the Urna. This is described in the text as a little circle of hair, unique to a Buddha, but one from which he can shoot a great beam of light with which he illuminates different universes in, in many Buddhist sutras. We see his hair curling to the right, another sign of a Buddha. But probably the most important of the signs of the Mahapurusha is the bump on the top of the Buddha's head. This is called the Ushnisha in Sanskrit. Uh, that just means turban. It's not a turban, of course. It's probably some kind of a top knot but it becomes so important in Buddhist thought. It has such power that the gods may not fly over it. It becomes deified as a goddess called Ushnisha Vijaya, the victorious Ushnisha. So here we can learn so much about the Buddha just from looking at his head. Absolutely, and traditionally in the apsital shrines that we know from Andhra and from the Nagarjuna Khanda and other sites, the entranceway was marked by a moonstone. And here we've introduced a later moonstone into the display. It's actually from Sri Lanka, from Anuradhapura, somewhat later in period, later first millennium, but evokes the idea in which the pilgrim or the devotee is making the transition from the mundane world to the sacred space, which houses the image of the Buddha. So this is really a spiritual transition moment mm -hmm. with these different realms represented by each of the concentric circles and at the very heart, the lotus itself. This transition we've seen from this early depiction of Naga cults and snakes and trees and symbolic representations of the Buddha's presence through to the fully realized human form. And this process has happened in the space of around 400 years mm -hmm. in the South. But it's very clear that there were contested opinions about how the Buddha should be represented. How could a mere human begin to represent the divine? And I know the Buddha is in one sense not divine. The Buddha is a human who has transitioned, if you like, mm -hmm. uh, to a higher realm as opposed to a self-manifest God. So many questions remain, of course, but we hope this exhibition will help us along the way Absolutely. to uh, address some of those. Absolutely. The core of this exhibition is the origins of Buddhist art, which can be approached on many levels. It presents breathtakingly beautiful art to be enjoyed and understood for its aesthetic qualities. It's redolent with Buddhist messages, and the imagery is very potent and addresses the central tenets of Buddhism and the ethical concerns embedded within the Buddhist teachings of compassion for all living beings and stewardship of the environment and the habitats that we share. As you have just seen, Buddhism inspired an extremely innovative and beautiful flowering of art in ancient India. It is a tremendous honor to present this stunning exhibition and to introduce new discoveries from this pivotal moment in the history of art to a global audience. We express a special thanks to the government of India and the six state governments in India who have all been generous lenders to this pioneering exhibition along with institutions in Europe and the United States. Tree and Serpent was conceived by John Guy, Florence and Herbert Irving Curator of South and Southeast Asian Art, and realized over several years. His resolute commitment brought this exhibition and publication to fruition, and we are most grateful for his dedication. Skilled teams of colleagues across the entire museum came together in collaboration under the leadership of Mike Hearn, Douglas Dillon Chair of the Department of Asian Art, and I thank them all for their dedication. Exhibitions of such rare antiquities are a monumental undertaking, and we are most grateful to the incredible sponsors who allowed us to realize our grand ambitions and this milestone in U.S.-Indian cultural partnership. My sincere thanks to Reliance Industries Limited, the Robert H. N. Ho Family Foundation Global, and the Fred Eichner Fund for their lead support and enthusiasm for the project. We are also grateful to the estate of Brooke Astor, the Florence and Herbert Irving Fund for Asian Art Exhibitions, and the E. Rhodes and Leonard B. Carpenter Foundation for their generous support. The enlightening catalog is made possible by the Florence and Herbert Irving Fund for Asian Art Publications, with additional funding from Albion Art Co. Limited, and I gratefully acknowledge their support. My thanks also go to the Fred Eichner Fund for supporting the symposium 
which will take place on September 29th and 30th. On behalf of everyone at the Met, thank you for joining us.